<laughs> and most of my videos are at least an hour or more long. And I learned that it's a good idea maybe uh, so you don't lose people right away to do time markers in a video. So check out that description box underneath the video here on YouTube and look to see what the time markers are. You may not want to sit through certain parts of the video so you can go immediately to a time marker that is telling you what's there at that point in the video. And that may speed up the process for you if you don't want to sit for an hour through everything. If you want to just get to the point, get those time markers and go right to the parts of the video you want to actually see and see them quickly. Uh, and I found that's worked very effectively. Uh, for a lot of my viewers over this last couple of years, we've been doing this. And I wish I would have known that years ago. All right, now let's just take a, a clear example of what I'm talking about with these time markers. Okay, a video we did called The Christian Worldview According to the Bible Alone, which is utterly rejected by most of the world. Here we see the time markers, which are located not only in the description text, right underneath the, the video, but then also down in the comment section. I always put the time marker uh, information down in the comment section as well. Usually I pin that comment at the top so people can see where they can click to certain parts of the video and go directly to those topics immediately. Okay, now let's take a look at this one now, just as an example. Here we see at the 1314 mark. If you want to just jump there to see what that talks about, it says Rob begins his presentation by sharing comments from Abraham Kuyper. You have a link there about the distinction between those who have been regenerated and those who are not. You click on that marker with your, your mouse, then you'll go right to this segment of that video. He begins by saying human beings would find differences between themselves and perhaps differences would be ultimately lead perhaps to some kind of advancement in the unity of truth. Okay, you just saw that immediately when you click on the time marker. Now let's take another example at the 1921 mark about John 3, 3 through 4. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You click on that and you go immediately to this clip. Jesus answered in John chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, to the question, how can one be born again in that pericope of the scripture by saying this? Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Okay, another example. Time marker 2841. The Great Divide. Natural man versus spiritual man. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. But the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. So I call it the Great Divide divide it's the difference between what the bible calls the natural man and what the bible calls the spiritual man listen to these words by the apostle paul he says in first corinthians chapter 2 in his letter to the corinthians now we have received not the spirit of the world but the spirit who is from god that we might know the things freely given to us by god which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. Now listen to this. This is important. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. Okay, one more example to show you how this all works. 4113 in the time marker. If you click on this, the following clip is what you'll immediately see. And he says, now the deeds of the flesh, these natural impulses are evident. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, worshiping a false god or anything you put in the place of the one true God. 
sorcery, messing around with satanic kinds of movies, shows, board games, videos, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and then he throws in, and things like these, okay? He gives a laundry list of the kinds of things that most Christians would read and say, well, I'm not, I'm not there. Wait a minute. Jealousy, strife, outbursts of anger, factions, sensuality. It doesn't sound like anybody can go to heaven. I mean, everybody's kind of done this or been a part of this. That's not the apostle's point. His point is, I forewarn you just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things, and what he means by practice such things is that there is no evident repentance, there's no evident conviction, there's no evident change in their behavior. They are going along to get along. They haven't stood against it in their own hearts, let alone the culture. And he says, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Here you have a clear example of how the time markers can not only give you a summary of what's contained in the entire video itself without you actually having to spend the time to watch the entire video. It'll also hone you in on the spots you are most interested in hearing about during the time you have available. So check out those time markers before you begin a video, which may save you a lot of time and also give you a good idea what the whole video is about. With that, We'll get into our programming. Thank you. Greetings and welcome once again to our broadcast. I'm Larry Wessels, your host, and I want to thank you for joining us again for Christian Answers Presents. Well, we got, as usual, and I usually say this on most of our 800 videos so far over the last 30 years, we have a very special guest, actually in this case, two special guests for our broadcast today. And one is the, one of our special guests is the author of uh, this book right here, Apostolic Succession. An experiment that failed. And we have the author of this book, David W. T. Bradston. And also joining us here, which our regular viewers are so used to seeing, uh, is our other guest, uh, Steve Morrison, PhD. I'll let him explain uh, that as we get into the phase where I have my two guests give a little background bio of themselves before we actually get into the topic. But uh, Steve Morrison is our director of research for Christian Answers. And uh, he has three websites, outstanding research material. If anyone ever deserved a title, director of research, <laughs> it's Steve. So anyway, let me uh, tell my guests to the, the world here. And you can see there, there are my guests. Uh, that's uh, Steve on one side and uh, David on the other. David is the one that has more hair. <laughs> so uh, uh, anyway, brothers, I want y'all to, since since uh, David is our special guest, even more special guest, because he's not on here regularly, of this book, Apostolic Succession. I, David, I'd like you to introduce yourself to our audience, maybe give a little background of your your personal history, the theological background or degrees or anything you might have, other writings you might have done. And uh, that way people have a better understanding of who you are and why you have the uh, authority to write a book like this. Go ahead, bro. I found uh, 
uh, several years ago that um, I had all sorts of questions and uh, and desire to know uh, on Christian topics, mostly for the governance of my own life. What am I to do in Christian ethics? I um, uh, uh, began researching uh, the uh, uh, early fathers. Now, the reason for the early fathers is that interpreting the Bible is it doesn't seem to be enough because all sorts of ethicists interpret the Bible one way or the other. And I thought the uh, best uh, interpretation would be that of the people who lived uh, immediately after Jesus and the apostles, those who could see what they did, who could who carried on their uh, unspoken uh, commandments and uh, parables. And uh, then, uh, so I said, and I had found that uh, as a judge in minor tribunals, the best way I could reach a decision was to write out everything that happened at the trial and then uh, research the law. Uh, now, uh, in, re in this research, 99.5% is not good enough. It has to be 100%. So I uh, began uh, with the uh, Apostolic Fathers and uh, gradually went to the year 250 because in the year 250, there were a number of circumstances that make uh, uh, the accuracy of Christian teaching uh, somewhat doubtful because of a mass epidemic and uh, a lot of people falling away from the faith. Oh, by the way, do you have a background in law and things like that? Background in law. I was a law librarian for four years. And then when I moved to Nova Scotia, I became a, a lawyer. And then in due time, you, we don't call them judges in Canada, but in the United States, they do call them judges for the various minor tribunals. And uh, in writing my decisions, as I said, 99.5% is not good enough. It has to be 100% correct. So I would write these things out with the um, uh, same... Uh, diligence and application that a lawyer would use in a legal brief. And I thought, well, I've come to the de this decision. Maybe other people are interested. They're maybe they're having the same problem. So I would send these off to magazines and publishers. Uh, as things uh, came about after uh, 20 years, I found I had published 400 articles mm -hmm. and 14 books. And uh, so that uh, I was, I was well um, uh, versed in uh, in uh, research and in the and compassion for other people who may have the same problem. Uh, at first, it was purely interpersonal ethics that I wrote about, and then I wrote about other Christian behavior, such as the Sabbath and papal supremacy. And uh, one booklet of two books, two books of uh, Christian ethics in a collection. Uh, and uh, the apostolic succession applies to Christian ethics because it applies to Christian behavior and to the all important question of who succeeded the apostles and that uh, what, uh, how to choose among the various ideas put forward. Uh, as being the closest to that of uh, Jesus and the apostles and their first followers. So now, I have, I have since run out of topics to write about. Mm. So about a year and a half ago, I enrolled at uh, um, in a master's Master of Arts program in theology at a Baptist seminary. Uh, uh, with a specialty in Christian history. And I think that brings you up to date to today. Excellent. Excellent. And before we proceed, let me uh, just go to Steve right there for a moment. And Steve, just tell us about your websites and your background. I mentioned to the people a minute ago, you had a PhD. Of course, you don't right. have to have a theological degree uh, to, as David was talking, uh, to really get into Christian stuff and history and everything else that's important in a Christian's life. If you yourself are 
a real Christian. Okay. You know, I mean, <laughs> so go ahead. Tell us uh, the folks a little bit about your background. Okay. Well, my, my PhD is actually in chemical engineering. So um, for however relevant it might be, um, I have uh, three websites. The first one is www.biblequery.org, uh, all one word, B-I-B-L-E-Q-U-E-R-Y. And it answers over 11,000 questions on the Bible. It has a lot on church history also. Uh, I have read every single writing in church history by Orthodox Christians, by Gnostics, by Ebionites, uh, up to 325 AD. And I'm working on stuff in kind of the next period until the Council of Ephesus, you know, 325 to 431 AD, but they actually wrote even more. Um, mm -hmm. And I have uh, their um, teachings on doctrine and some on ethics uh, uh, documented on the site BibleQuery.org. Uh, there's kind of a sub part of that. Um, uh, it's called uh, BibleQuery.org slash BibleQuery app, and it has uh, translations of the Bible in uh, over something like 125 translations, like eight or nine English ones and then other languages. Uh, there are many other good sites that have translations of the Bible, too, but uh, mine has a concordances. Uh, of them. So if you ever want to find all the words that start, I mean, all the verses that have a particular phrase, and you would need to find that in French or Cebuano or, uh, you know, Thai or something like that, well, my web, that, that website would have that. Uh, my nice. second web, website is um, uh, geared toward Muslims and the great hope that they have when they leave Islam and find the real Jesus. It's called www muslimhope.com m-u-s-l-i-m hope.com all one word and then a, a third site combines the uh history part of bible query and the history part of muslimhope.com and it's called a historycart.com uh, uh and it's like a subset of both of those two, of those two sites and um so I've uh, studied the Bible. Someone once said you can see far when you stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, mm -hmm. Many people long, long before me have answered questions on, on the Bible. I think going back to Ambrosiaster, actually, um, and reading their things and looking at their answers and kind of combining things together and getting questions from other Christians and non-Christians. Um, you know, the, I have it available for everybody to see for free. You know, what's always impressed me about your historycart.com, which is, like you said, it, it's coming from your other two, the, all that history you have on those other two websites of yours, is I can ask you almost any church history question, and you've got it all configured because you're also a computer programmer of some Right. <laughs> I mean, you really know how to program it. But I'm amazed how I can ask you a question like you're on a computer you know, and I send you an email or something. All of a sudden, you give me pages of what early church fathers said because you have it all organized into a program where you can bring up all these early church fathers that answer the very question I'm asking about who said what. Yeah. And, and it, I'm sitting there going, whoa. Well, I mean, it, what, 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 <laughs> all my tools are, are, are doing that are on that site. So... I yeah. guess my message for every Christian is you can answer pretty much any question on the Bible or church history that somebody asks you. Here's the answer. Was saying that, it, it, uh, it, it, you know, yeah. from the past. It, 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 here's the answer to give. If you don't know it, say, I don't know, but I'll get back to you. And then <laughs> you and, 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 and then you go to the website and you find it. And yeah. if it's not there, um, then you can um you know, and ask me and I'll research it. And, and then, of course, you get back to them. Uh, mm -hmm. One Christian from the Middle East had like a 100 objections to the Bible that a Muslim gave him. So 24 hours, I gave him answers to all 100 because it was just copying and pasting <laughs> from my website. And then he had another right. 100 and I gave those. So Yep, and you can do it all in a few minutes because you've got it all programmed where you can yank all this information. Yeah. You being the superior com computer programmer you are. I'm yeah. always amazed at that. You didn't win that. You didn't get earn that PhD for nothing. That's for sure. Yeah. That's like <laughs> high respect. Okay, so now we've established all this. Uh, so I want to get back to David here, the author of this book, and we're going to come to the question about uh, the meaning of 
And of course, you had emailed me this before, and you asked me, "Is that fine?" I said, "That's fine, no, no problem." Uh, this comes right out of your book, as a matter of fact. Meaning of apostolic succession. Uh, so, David, could you give us a synopsis of what you basically say about that? Apostolic succession is a doctrine or theory or concept that the legitimate ministry of the Christian Church comes through a continuous succession of incumbent bishops ordaining new clergymen, such as a new bishop by laying their hands on him, running in an unbroken line back to the apostles. It is essential that the ordaining bishops themselves have been ordained by similar bishops who had been ordained by similar bishops in an unbroken pedigree which stretches back to the apostles. According to its adherents since the Reformation, such apostolic succession is indispensable for sacraments to be valid, guarantees doctrinal orthodoxy, and gives sole authority to the bishop to ordain clergy. In our time, ordination in the apostolic succession confers the right to govern the church in the geographic areas assigned to a bishop, usually a diocese consisting of several congregations. He is the ultimate authority within the area allotted to him. Apostolic succession is held and practiced by the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox, the Oriental Orthodox in Egypt and Armenia, the Assyrian Church of the East, which broke off around 431, Anglicans and Episcopalians, and some other denominations with centralized administration. Recently, some major Lutheran denominations have been receiving at least the title of apostolic succession, but it is not yet known how much their bishops will use it to create new powers for themselves over their flocks. Apostolic succession is not found in the Bible because it addresses a problem in life situation not found until after New Testament times. It answers the question, who takes the place of the apostles after they died? The first written records of apostolic succession appear in the late 2nd century and early 3rd in the writings of the Church Fathers Irenaeus of Lyon in France and Tertullian in what is today Tunisia. Irenaeus said that a diligent investigator can see the truth and the teaching handed down by the apostles by consulting bishops who had been ordained by bishops who had themselves been ordained by bishops, etc., in lines stretching back to the ordinations by apostles. Irenaeus said that such lines of succession could be traced down to our own times, meaning the AD 180s. According to Tertullian, a few years later, Succession was a judge or a safeguard of the correctness of interpretation of the Bible and not vice versa. There were all many Gnostic groups around that would uh, twist the Bible and, and say this is the proper interpretation and vary among themselves as well as vary from the ma mainstream church. Mm -hmm. So um, he said that you should go to the apostles in the succession and they have the correct interpretation. Tertullian regarded the doctrine transmitted by the apostolic succession as a criterion of an doctrinal orthodoxy. To know whether a congregation was in due succession and therefore upheld to doctrine, an inquirer was to consult its doctrine and the archival roles of its bishops and its unity with other congregations that possessed identical doctrine and lists of bishops stretching back to the apostles. Both Irenaeus and Tertullian can find apostolic succession to Christian doctrine and belief. It was only later ages that extended it to govern the church in other ways. Over the centuries, the monopoly over doctrinal orthodoxy has come to include the sole authority to interpret the Bible and church tradition correctly, which leads to the Episcopally ordained bishops having the final word on the appropriate form of church government and teaching as a matter of doctrine. Since the Middle Ages, the following types of exclusive ecclesiastical powers are alleged to be transmitted to clerics in the apostolic succession as part and parcel of their office. They include governing the church spiritually and materially, validating sacraments, deciding and teaching points of doctrine, ordaining pastors and deacons, church structure, and collecting money. Now, if you read the uh, Irenaeus and Tertullian, it sounds like a pretty good idea. However, apostolic succession does not work and did not work. 
Even since Christian antiquity, apostolic succession has failed to guarantee unity of doctrine and cooperation in harm and harmony in ministry. In the third century itself, contending factions split the church at Rome, first involving Hippolytus and later Novation, both claiming much credibility that they were descended from apostolic pedigrees. Better known as the Avignon or Western Schism from 1378 to 1417, during which countries in Western Europe recognized different men in apostolic succession as a false soul, a vicar of Christ in possession of the succession. There were also repeated re- ejections and restorations of patriarchs of Constantinople and other bishops in the succession. Today, there is a vast variety of denominations claiming apostolic succession through the laying on of hands by bishops in the Roman lineage, but they are now divided by a multitude of differences on ethics, dogma, and practice. These would be mostly Anglicans. The principle of apostolic succession has been discredited most by the people who claim it for themselves. Some denominations claiming apostolic succession for their clergy deny that particular other denominations possess it. For instance, in the late 19th century, Pope Leo XIII said all Anglican uh, ordinations were null and void and that it was and that the Anglicans did not form a proper church. Some denominations claiming apostolic succession for their clergy denied or only they inherit uh, the proper lineage. Ang- Episcopalians are currently flying every which way over a variety of issues while still recognizing the pedigrees of their opponents, with about 17 or so competing Anglican denominations. The most common issues are the ordination of women and homosexuals. Some of these divisions divisions touch on theology, which means that the original framers of the concept of apostolic succession would be disappointed with institutional succession in office and find another way of preserving orthodoxy, order, and unity. In establishing apostolicity, the ancient writers listed only a few pedigrees of bishops. We would expect a role of successions for prominent bishops such as Ephesus and the other six churches, which are known to exist from the Revelation of God, John, but uh, they don't appear to, to be list for these uh, uh, six churches. While the identities of bishops in the pedigree were ascertainable when Irenaeus and Tertullian wrote, Later generations would know them only as names on a long list and be unable to verify if the list was accurate. As in the case of systems at Rome, sometimes there was more than one list for rival claimants. In any event, such lists were not kept up, if they even existed after the first few centuries. Sometimes there were an hour more than one claimant to the same bishopric, such as that of Antioch, with no way through bishop roles to choose among rivals. For instance, today there are five claimants to be the legitimate bishop of Antioch, representing the Syriac Orthodox Church, the Greek Orthodox Church of Antioch, the Syriac Catholic Church, the Melkite Greek Catholic Church, and the Maronite Church. By the 5th century AD, the lineages of local bishops were not kept up to date nor preserved through, through, through sheer, either through sheer negligence or because Christians regarded succession itself as no longer of consequence. The fact remains that they have been lost and there is no way to trace with the all-important continuity to our times that it, its advocates attribute to it. All bishoprics contain, claiming Apostolic succession today asserts that they were founded by one or more of the original 12 apostles or by men who the New Testament records record as having been in close association with them, such as Paul, Barnabas, and Mark. However, they cannot exhibit anything even remotely like the roles of their alleged predecessors. The exceptions are Aquila in Italy, Alexandria in Egypt, and Philip the Evangelist for Ethiopia. But even in these lists, there are gaps of over 200 years before the, between the first Christian contact and the establishing of a local church organization as we know it, such that we are tempted to dismiss these ancient foundations as legends. The same is true of the Russian Orthodox Church claiming descent from Andrew the Apostle. As in many other localities, apostolic succession is claimed on the sole basis of an apostle having preached there, 
without founding a permanent Christian community or leaving probative evidence of a bishop or continuity of Christianity of any sort. Similar claims by congregations, dioceses, and whole denominations can be dismissed as wishful thinking unless they can affirmatively produce a list of bishops rooted in apostolic times. Now, this, the, some people might say, well, the church was started and it exists today, so we can hop over the uh, time of uh, no active church. If long breaks in lineage over worshiping communities are unimportant from founding a possible to a church today, remember that hundreds of sects descended from Herbert W. Armstrong assert they possess open proof in their succession until the early third century and alleged persisted in secret until public coordinations were recommenced in the 20th century. The same argument would apply to the Latter-day Saints with their contention that the Christian church disappeared around 100 and was fully restored in the 1830s with full apostolic powers. What I'm saying is that uh, the uh, uh, many of the Orthodox churches and um, many of the dioceses uh, th their line of succession is, uh, and uh, legitimacy as a church in that succession is no stronger than that of Herbert W. Armstrong or Joseph Smith. Yeah. Actually, ancient Christians rejected the possibility of such a scenario of jumping over time when they disallowed the Montanists of contention that the Holy Spirit somehow escaped the apostles and first descended on Montanist prophets in the middle of the second century replacing the mainstream church. Many small sects claim such secret and underground ordinations to invent authority for their present bishops. Such episodic session can and is claimed by all manner of denominations who are far from proving it. So it's not enough for the Pope to say I'm in apostolic succession. Uh, you, you can't assume that as a given. You have to prove it by uh, producing a list. There are about 5,000 Roman Catholics in our day who claim to be bishops in a line of ordinations from the apostles. Some 96.5% of them trace their pedigree no further back than an Italian bishop who was appointed in 1541. There is no documentary evidence as to who ordained him. Thus, almost no present Roman claim can be verified as far back as can the Protestant churches with an Episcopal polity. For instance, Swedish Lutheran bishops trace their pedigrees from 1531, a decade earlier, because a Roman Catholic bishop appointed by the Pope of Rome had ordained him in a pedigree stretching all the way back to 1439. This also entails that some Lutheran bishops have a pedigree of succession going back farther than the present Roman Pope, which, even though the uh, Swedish line is only um, a little over 500 years old. I imagine the time between 1439 and 1541 was lost to the general Roman Catholic succession because many bishops left the Roman Church about that time and also in the 1870s and did not participate in Roman ordinations. For the status of my succession, for the status of the succession in my home area, I contacted the local Anglican diocese asking if it possesses a role going back from its present incumbent to the apostles and asked whether I could come in and look at it. In response to my third request, the arch archivist ended her email with, we have no such list, and an expression of regret that she could not have helped me in this matter. I also wrote to my local Roman Catholic Archdiocese. The reply contained an impressive number of ordinations going back to the 1500s. Three early prede predecessors of the present archbishop were in three different lineages, with the earlier two claiming only as far back as 16th century popes and the latest pedigree starting with the aforesaid Italian bishop appointed in 1541. There was a seven-year break in the 1870s in Nova Scotia, something like the two-year-long vacancies after four popes in the Middle Ages. This is in sharp contrast to Irenaeus and Tertullian, who contemplated consulting the bishop roles to be a quick and easy process. Now, gentlemen, if I may, I would like to invite um, Christian Answers viewers to uh, make similar inquiries from their local Episcopalian and even Orthodox and especially Roman Catholic um, um, 
dioceses and uh, um, uh, e email uh, the results to me so the next edition of the book can uh, be more full. Yeah, we'll I'll do like that when this gets to. out. And if you yeah. put, uh, put my, um, my uh, email address at the bottom of the screen. Okay. Is that acceptable to you? Sure. Yes, in fact, go ahead and say your email address right now at this point of the video, and then everyone will see that at this time while they're watching it. Okay, the first um, uh, part of the email address is uh, my name. D as in David, W as in Walter, T as in Thomas, B as in Boy, R as in Robert, A as in Apple, T as in Thomas, a second T as in Thomas, S as in Simon, a third T is in Thomas, O N, at hotmail.com. Excellent. We'll make sure that gets in the video. <laughs> That's a good question, though, to have these people check about in their local places where they are. And it'll get back to you. I thought I could do only my own, own local area because. Uh, uh, Go in all sorts of places in Australia and, and uh, Britain and the United States. Oh yeah, um, that that would be too much. And so I and as I mentioned in uh, the introduction at the very beginning of the program, uh, I wanted the to uh, find out what Christian ethics and Christian practice are for myself and what I can do, rather than uh, what happens in Australia or Britain. Right now, Steve also runs our. Anyone that emails Christian answers, uh, he answers those. And then depending on whether he needs to send it to me or also any viewers that miss your email address, David, they can send it to Steve over at uh, Bible.org. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and, and, at AOL.org. See, that's how old our ministry is. We have an AOL email address <laughs> <I will talk. laughs> yeah. but but if anyone sends me that i can forward that yeah, yeah. it's on the screen too there so we'll have that so but, you but, got you covered but, two ways yeah but but david it, it it seems like you're saying that before we ask the question is apostolic succession valid we have to find a general case of claimed apostolic succession and you Ooh. haven't found one yet after my book was published, I came across a research article in a Roman Catholic journal by a Roman Catholic priest at a Roman Catholic university who, after long search and consultations with Roman Catholic experts, concluded that the line of successions of the Roman majority right bishops in Canada cannot be traced before the 16th of March, 1541. Hmm. I don't know whether a similar study has been published for the United States Roman Catholic bishops. Hmm. Now, yeah. this leads to papal succession. Um, uh, the role of bishops for which we possess the best attestation is the city of Rome. Yet there is much doubt as to who were the first successors of the Apostle Peter. Around AD 180, he wrote that Peter and Paul had ordained Linus as the first Roman bishop, and then Anacletus, and, and then Clement. However, Tertullian, 20 years later, offered an incompatible account. Instead of Peter and Paul instituting Linus as first bishop of Rome, and then Clement being the third in the list of Irenaeus' claims, Tertullian said Peter ordained Clement as the first Roman bishop. It is odd that there was a contradiction in the succession list of repeatedly the most important and most watched church officer in Christendom. The discrepancy cannot have been because no one early enough had thought to make a list. About 155 to 166 AD, the traveler Hegesippus compiled the succession list for the city, which was known to Eusebius in the 4th century, but has since been lost. Hegesippus drafted lists of bishops of some other localities and concluded that Christianity had everywhere remained doctrinally pristine until the second or third bishop after the apostles, with the dividing line around ABD 100 as the beginning of heresy, and that there were still uh, orthodox and uh, doctrinally sound bishops uh, after that date, at, at least as uh, late as uh, 166. Now, note that Hegesippus was searching only, only 
as to doctrine, not as to governing the church spiritually and materially, validating sacraments, deciding and teaching points of doctrine, or ordaining pastors and deacons. Whatever continuity Rome possessed was broken in the Hippolytus, Callistus, or Cornelius Novation schisms in the third century, or those concerning Avignon in the Middle Ages, with two or sometimes three men claiming to be Bishop of Rome and even a fourth. If such succession roles ever existed for Rome after the fourth century, nobody kept them up. There are also records of several periods when the papal chair was vacant for months or even years, breaks in the line of bishops in Rome. Roman Catholics will try giving you a long line of uh, bishops in, in a role that's contemplated by Arrhenius and Tertullian, but there are breaks of the role and, in many cases, question marks after the dates. So, mm -hmm. so uh, making an assertion and proving it are two different things. That's uh, um, one thing I learned in law, that uh, an argument is not proof. You have to uh, bring in uh, real um, solid evidence and facts. Oh, uh, David, Steve did a video on what Carl Keating forgot to mention about things. Uh, Steve, do you think Carl Keating forgot to mention this list of popes uh, going all the way back that David's talking about? Yeah, he forget he forgot to mention a lot, uh, a lot. The, the, the video is, uh, is called "Why Catholics Don't Need a Pope." Um, <laughs> yes, Carl Keating is the founder of Catholic Answers, which tries yeah. to they, they got all the evidence from the Church Fathers for all this history. But anyway, continue, David. Continue with your reading. The Canadian uh, article I mentioned was uh, by Frank G. Morrissey, titled "The Apostolic Succession of the Canadian Latin Rite Bishops." That was published in 1972. Today, no bishop, uh, no bishop of Rome can meet the symbol or uh, 96 and a half percent of uh, alleged Roman Catholic bishops. None of them can, today can meet the simple and straightforward test which Tertullian laid out when the concept of apostolic succession was being formulated. Now, we know from Agesippus that it existed before, but to and Irenaeus, towards the end of the second century, uh, first put it in, uh, it, it wrote on it uh, at length. Tertullian wrote, If there be any heresies which are bold enough to plant themselves in the midst of the apostolic age, that they may thereby seem to have been handed down by the apostles, because they existed in the time of the apostles, we can say, let them produce the original records of their churches. Let them unfold the role of their bishops, running down in due succession from the beginning, in such a manner that that first bishop of theirs shall be able to show for his ordained and predecessor some one of the apostles or of apostolic men, a man moreover who continues steadfast with the apostles. For this is the manner in which the apostolic church transmit their registries. Note the present tense. This is the the original apostolic succession. And I think the book shows that uh, uh, there were su such wide departures from it and and uh, uh, lack of scholarship that uh, we just don't have apostolic you know, Nobody has apostolic succession today. Now, there is a second facet of uh, the apostolic succession, laying on of hands. Some denominations with hierarchical policies most notably the Roman Catholic Church, have forgotten an essential element in the process of making someone a clergyman. They assume it is enough for bishops to lay their hands on a candidate. To them, this is the essential act in transmitting apostolic succession. What they forget is that the earliest churches insisted on lay people electing their clergy, just as Baptist congregations today call and elect a pastor for themselves. Without this, it did not matter what outsiders thought or claimed. The two have to go together to carry the succession to a new generation. Without election by the people, the bishops could not ordain and thus not convey apostolic succession. This is a far cry from the Roman Catholic Church today, where all bishops are chosen solely by the Pope, and the parish clergy are appointed solely by the bishop, sometimes against the will of the people and other clergy. Thus, there remain two crucial reasons why apostolic succession has not continued to our own times. Right. So, well said. That's the, Actually, that's almost verbatim. Not exactly verbatim, but the start of your book. So, 
I thought that's that what what was that? I'm, I thought that's what I the subway of the book. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, it's excellent. So that really helped explain right up front the major subject of this topic. So, yeah, yeah. Could, could I ask ahead. a question? Uh, David, could you explain uh, kind of the differences between apostolic succession that you're talking about and papal succession? Well, apostolic uh, papal succession is a subspecies of uh, of apostolic succession. Just okay. as all bishops are supposedly in in lines of ordination from the apostles, the uh, Pope of Rome is in a line of succession uh, from the apostle Peter, one of the apostles. Okay, thank you. And uh, I have a question here. Since I prepare for this show, I'm as the host. I I gotta keep you guys talking and stuff like that. So uh, I wanted to ask you the question, David and Steve. So just answer in turn. Is apostolic succession biblical? So when you read the Bible, you see in the Bible that the Bible says you've got to have this line of you know, successors who also lay hands on each other all the way back to Peter, the first pope. Of course, I'm just joking when I say the first pope. But, but anyway, uh, so uh, David, what do you... What does the Bible say? Does the Bible say you're supposed to have this doctrine of papal succession? The apostolic succession is not found in the Bible because it addresses a situation in life and a problem for the church that did not arise until after New Testament times. The question is, who succeeds the apostles? This was no problem in the New Testament because the apostles are still given alive and in good health. So, uh, the, these people found themselves after the apostles have gone, who replaces them? And some people said uh, the bishops in succession. So it's, it, it's not biblical, and the Bible doesn't provide for the situation. Is it more just a tradition of men that this, this idea came along? So uh, I don't know of men. I think it was, uh, well, a pretty good idea of men, but... Uh, some sometimes uh, a good idea at the time uh, uh, does not work out, such as the Russian Revolution of 1917, prohibition, mm -hmm. and many marriages. What do you say? Well, I, I would say that apostolic succession, including papal succession, is not scriptural because it's not found in the Bible, but it's not anti scriptural either. It, it's sort of like things like, let's say, uh, pulpit in a church, pews in the church, you know, Sunday school or having a parking lot. Though none of those are scriptural, but they aren't necessarily anti-scriptural. And one way to look at it, which I had never thought of before, is what David mentioned in the title of his book, that it was like a human experiment that people decided to try. And going through history, we can say that it failed. Um and, and it, so, so I'm not going to knock it for saying, hey, it's not found in the Bible, because a lot of other things aren't found in the Bible, but it's not there and it didn't work. A couple of things about the papal succession part of it is that the, the, uh, the, the, the first pope uh, was actually not uh, in Rome. The Coptic Church, they also believe in apostolic succession and papal succession. And the first guy who called himself a pope or was called a pope was Heraclius of Alexandria, 232 to 249 AD. And people in Rome, were leaders in Rome were called bishops, but we have no record of anybody in Rome being called a pope until the Council of Arles in 314 AD, and the next reference, 347. And then Syricius, about 384 to 389 AD, was the first Roman bishop to call himself a pope. So... This, as far as early church history goes, this idea of a Roman pope is kind of a newfangled thing. Yes. Uh, and there was, there was no bishop at all of Rome, just a council of elders until the time of Irenaeus. And mm -hmm. uh, well known uh, and conceded that uh, there was no bishop of Rome until the middle of the uh, uh, second century. And the way our, um, Ignatius talks about uh, uh, the uh, 
leadership at Rome, it's clear that even in the 180s, there was no single bishop. So the Pope of Alexandria uh, of the Coptic Church, uh, even today calls himself, uh, or is called Pope of Alexandria. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, there, yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so someone says they believe the Pope, you got to ask him, uh, wh which one? <laughs> <laughs> yep. And anyway, you're both... Uh, brilliantly exposing the fact that uh, church history itself refutes the whole idea of this apostolic succession. And the apostolic succession are its worst enemies. Yes, exactly. And, and a lot of your book, David, gets into a lot of that as we go into details, where you use church history as a sledgehammer to... Uh, start breaking this whole concept of the succession apostolic succession apart. I did want to say one thing about something Steve said, but this is just an aside. I just thought it was interesting because you were talking about how parking lots might be <laughs> about they're as not important. Scriptural, they're not anti-scriptural. Yeah. Right, right, right. And when you said that, it reminded me of the, there's, you know, they did a, like, I think it was Barna research or Pew research or one of these, these, polling survey services, ask people why they go to church. What are the two main reasons, the, the, the most important reasons they go to church? And uh, the number one reason was how close is it to where I live? That was mm -hmm. the most important reason why they go to that church, the church they go to, because it's nearby. And okay. the second most important reason they go to a church is it has good parking. Huh. So now, okay. now you know why most people go to the churches they go to for those two two reasons. I always that always stuck in my head. I read that years ago, but I go, oh, oh those are good. oh those are great reasons to go to the church you go to, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so David uh, kind of has talked already about how we're not sure we can even find. <laughs> a legitimate case of apostolic succession today. However, even if we could find one, um, would that guarantee that the person would have right doctrine? Well, one pope was dug up after he died and tried for heresy, so it doesn't guarantee that. Does that agree that they're li li like a, a moral person? Does that agree they won't do horrible things or whatever? And obviously, people probably know, and we've done shows already, uh, about why us as non-Catholics say, no, it doesn't guarantee that. But I'd like to read for you briefly uh, what a Catholic writer, uh, Gary Mills, uh, who in his book, Why I Am a Catholic, uh, what he says about the popes. And I don't agree with everything Gary Mills says, but I have to say, he does say some interesting things. All right. Uh, and I'll just read a, a little bit here. He, he says, this is from Why I'm a Catholic, uh, uh, chapter 22, page 283. Support of the papacy is possible for the conscientious only if certain things are recognized. I believe there are a number of such conditions to be met. One must recognize for a start that the papacy is a deeply flawed institution. Saying such a thing is considered by some Catholics to be disloyal. Apparently, they believe that only the only real Catholic is one able and willing to deny a long history of abuses and corruption. The assertion is prefaced with an, of course. Of course, there have been individual popes who were bad. Certain persons, piccadillos or individual sins, usually commit a long ago. Boniface the Eighth, political vendettas, Alexander the Sixth, bastards, Julius the Second, war crimes, and so on. Dante and others in the Middle Ages put this or that pope in hell. But these were blemishes on an essentially noble and holy record. Extraneous faults not connected with the core of papal teaching. Then Gary says, this is an evasion, an attempt to deny that the institution itself has been at fault over long stretches of time. The record shows centuries of principled and authoritatively ordered repression, centuries in which the papacy or its agents tortured and executed people for thought crimes, persecuted Jews and other non-Christians, persecuted for that matter, Christians who differ with Rome's doctrines, suborned or excused political assassinations, sang a papal te deum for the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, opposed political freedoms and democracy, burned books, burned witches, and called all these actions holy, blessed by God, and even commanded by God. 
and uh, and 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 skipping ahead, he says something kind of a shocking statement. In terms of basic decency, the average president of the United States has been a better human than the average pope. Okay, this is written by a guy who um, was Catholic, still is Catholic, and defends the Catholic Church in other parts of the books. And he says, but if you got to be honest, you got to admit that um, the, the papacy has carried forward with its claim of, you know, papal succession with an apostolic succession has been deeply flawed. And he's honest enough to admit that. Uh, one thing I've noticed is there are different flavors of apostolic succession uh, in different denominations. Um, this is pretty eye-opening to a lot of Catholics to say that. On the other hand, if you tell uh, like an Eastern Orthodox person who is a who is a scholar and study their stuff that some of their patriarchs uh, have been heretics or have been you know rotten people, uh, the Eastern Orthodox will say, "Yeah, I know." You, you, you know, you know, you know, they aren't perfect. So they have maybe a, I would call it maybe a little lower form of apostolic succession that, 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 than Roman Catholicism. So it's not just a Catholic thing, um, but it, it's interesting how I see different flavors. My reply would be that none of these moral miscreants uh, mentioned, the, uh, especially the Pope that was dug up and uh, tried and condemned, and, and the ones who committed the uh, war crimes and uh, illegitimacies, none of these were in the apostolic succession. And uh, there is also the case of Pope Honorius, whom the Council of Chalcedon um, excommunicated after his death. So it's okay. worth long time back that uh, either the apostolic succession does not give uh, uh, holiness of life or that uh, apostolic succession had disappeared. Okay, I, so, 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 the, so there are two ways of looking at it. One, it do, didn't do anything for anybody. And then the second view that you <laughs> said is it wasn't really apostolic succession in the first place. Okay, well, so, you can look at it either way. Not at this late time, and of course, you know, Irenaeus and Tertullian's time and Hegesippus's time, it was there, but uh, for some reason, the uh, the uh, succession was not kept up. Moreover, another reason that uh, these uh, um, Roman, Roman popes uh, were not in the succession is that they were not elected by the people. And mm -hmm. as we have today, yeah, clergy must be elected by the people to be properly ordained. Yes. Okay. And uh, I have a question for you two now. One of the, uh, one of the, there's three verses that a lot of these apologists for the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Roman Catholic Church, and some of these other groups that argue for apostolic succession is uh, the following, these three verses. Now, I want y'all to react to these three verses because to them, they think these three verses out of the Bible prove apostolic succession. Now, we already saw said that this apostolic, uh, apostolic succession is not biblical, and I agree with both of you. But anyway, they use these three verses, and I'd just like y'all to respond to these three verses that, that the Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholics and other ones try to use to prove it. It's 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, and, and, and that states, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. That's the first verse that's supposed to prove apostolic succession. Uh, go ahead and take a shot at this, and I'll knock out the other two real fast after you do that, and y'all can respond to each verse one by one. So does, does this clearly prove apostolic succession from this verse, or would it be more of a twisting of the scriptures? As as it, Paul talked about, it, it proves a succession of some uh, some sort because uh, this is uh, Timothy uh, passing on to a later generation. This would be apostolic succession. However, you have the same sort of succession, and the, the scripture does not rule out as one uh, mentor Baptist pastor teaching a younger Baptist pastor who teaches a third, so that you don't need. Uh, bishops to have over over a diocese to have uh, uh apostolic succession okay so, so, so this doesn't Steve? say faithful bishops this says faithful men um so 
people yeah, that's what are, 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 are supposed yeah. to, to teach and disciple other people, uh, we don't want to limit it to say, oh, only one guy in the church can do this. You know, the bishop. No, this is something for all believers to do. So I would argue that they don't pay attention to this verse enough. <laughs> Very good. Okay, now here's the next one that uh, Romanists and uh, East, Eastern Orthodox use, along with these other guys. Uh, Matthew 16, 18. Of course, that just ring a bell with everybody. Yeah, Matthew 16, 18. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, end quote. Uh, so this obviously is the old argument that Peter is the rock of the church, and apostolic succession comes from Peter as the first pope, and all that. So, David, what do you have to say about that one? I was, uh, I, I think the the clearest and most convincing argument against that principle is was formulated by James White of Alpha and Omega Ministries. It doesn't say, "I now give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven," or "I have given you the keys, but I will give you uh, the keys." And but it doesn't say well, the, whether whether Jesus will give them to anyone else. If you go exactly two chapters later, um, uh, Jesus gave the keys to all the apostles, mm -hmm. uh, yes. and Peter is was nobody special. So the uh, Pope of Rome is nobody special, and the apostles carried on this apostolic session for the next several generations, but it's since been lost. However, well, that, that, go ahead. Uh, there is the idea that some powers were given to the apostles and the clergy. Others, such as the right to forgive, uh, the power to forgive sins, were uh, conveyed to the church in general. So that, uh, 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 in the words of origin, that every Christian is a Peter hmm. for certain purposes. So, uh, 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 Peter is uh, was not unique because he didn't share the power, and uh, either with uh, because he shared the power with the other apostles, or in the alternative, he shared the power with all Christians general, including the three of us and Mister Rosemont. Amen. In fact, uh, uh, just before you jump in, Steve, when you mentioned James White, I remember him because I listened to all his dividing line uh, broadcast on sermon audio and sometimes on YouTube, uh, but mainly I'm listening to him all the time on sermon audio. But I remember him saying that, that when you started talking, when you started quite, quoting James White, I was like, yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. So that was a good point. That was a very good point. Okay, uh, Steve, what do you have to say about wait, Matthew wait, wait, 16, wait. 18? Okay. Uh, pretending for sake of argument that it, that, that, that it was Peter who was the rock and pretending for sake of argument that it was only Peter and nobody but Peter, which I don't agree with, but pretend that. This says nothing about successors. <laughs> uh, however, the, the keys and, and, and the apostolic uh, authority was given to all apostles, as David just said. Uh, and, and, and furthermore, I think that the rock is really the revelation that Jesus is the Christ. Now, all the apostles are foundation rocks of the church. So in that sense, Peter is... A, a, I would say as a Protestant that Peter is a rock of the church because all the apostles and prophets, uh, you know, are, are the foundation of the church. But don't lose sight of the fact that Jesus is is the cornerstone. So, yeah. but 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 even giving, even letting Catholics, you know, concede what they say, it doesn't say successors. That's right. That's right. Excellent job, gentlemen. Now the last verse that they like to use to prove apostolic succession. It's Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or by epistle. So it's the traditions. In this tradition of apostolic succession, in their context, uh, here's a verse that proves it right here. So go ahead, David. What do you have to say about Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15? Apostolic succession is purely a matter of tradition. Uh, one Christian handing down to another to another. 
uh, but more likely one group of Christians discussing something and younger members come in and learn and they pass on to younger members. So that's tradition. All my uh, writings have uh, concerned the tradition, uh, the apostolic tra tradition, as I like to call it, that uh, it's it's uh, the the uh, uh, apostolic succession is, is uh, part of the tradition, and uh, and often in my books I point out why uh, the tradition should be observed, the early tradition, as I mentioned at the very first. Uh, the tradition becomes shaky and unreliable after the middle of the third century. And mm -hmm. if you want a full exposition of why Christians should, today should follow uh, tradition, the apostolic tradition, uh, I have 51 reasons for it in the first volume of my uh, set of books, Traditional Christian Ethics. Now, uh, David, where can uh, viewers watching us right now on um, out there in the world across the YouTube land uh, where can they get that book you just mentioned, the fifty-one? Uh, how do they obtain it? Do you get it through Amazon? I got, I got your book through Amazon. Amazon, but uh, first, uh, um, go to your public library and say you want an interlibrary loan of David W. T. Braxton, um traditional Christian ethics, and that will do it for you. The book, the book, buy only the, if you must buy, and I think you can get it on interlibrary loan for free. Mm -hmm. I only the first volume because the other three volumes are just details of ethics. Okay. I got you. Thank you. Okay, uh, D uh, Steve, what do you got to say about well, this? Well, 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 first of all, David was talking about the early apostolic tradition. <clears throat> I don't think we necessarily want to follow the later traditions <clears throat> of burning people at the stake because we think they're <laughs> witches. Um, the Council of Nicaea too. That's the one in 787 um, A.D. said you couldn't uh, have a new church unless it had a relic. And, you know, uh, by that time, relics were extremely popular and extremely profitable. So I don't think we want to follow, follow lousy traditions. I think what was intended in that verse was the biblical traditions that the, the godly people in the Bible in the Old Testament and, you know, and, and, and New Testament have. And so I've done a lot of study limiting myself from um, the time of after the New Testament to 325 A.D. And I found out uh, we have about 4,425 pages or so uh, of early Christian writings. Now, the question is, uh, what do you call a page? And I mean a page in a book. Excuse me a second. A, a, a page in a book about this size. We have over 4,425 pages of those. We have around 91, uh, oh, plus 1,000 pages just by Eusebius of Caesarea. So that's about 5,400 pages. That's in 91 writers. So we have a lot of things that they wrote. And I was curious, did they disagree all over the map or do they all say kind of the same thing? Well, what I found out, it wasn't 100% one or the other, but they, but but there were about... Um, would uh would uh one thousand and and sixty seven things that they wrote uh that four or more writers all wrote about and none denied. Um, they also wrote um about one hundred and three non scriptural things. Uh, can you always trust tradition? Well, not exactly. Um, usually they kind of got off base when they started talking about things that weren't biblical, like they said that the Earth was, I mean, the, the universe is made of four elements, air, earth, fire, and water. Why did they say that? Because that was the prevalent Greek science of the time. Um, they knew of this one concept called atoms, a uh, small uh, theory about these small individual spheres that made up everything. And they said atoms are ridiculous. All right. So they didn't get everything right. But on the biblical stuff, when they stuck to scripture, um, they did pretty good. Uh, and, 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 and we would agree with all these things today. Now, were they totally uniform in what they taught? And the answer is no, they, they weren't completely. I found like 51 things um, where some Christians said one thing, early Christian writers, and some other early Christian writers um, said the opposite. So, you know, they look like they were, you know, um, fallible Christians that weren't perfect. However, you could think of them uh, not as maybe our older brothers and sisters in the Lord. And we can look at their stuff and yeah, we can look at them and say, boy, they forgot to consider this and this. 
But on the other hand, you can read the writings and say, you know, reading through the writings, we're forgetting about these things today. And so you kind of get it. You don't get any teachings that are important that aren't in Scripture, but it gives you maybe a fresh view of Scripture in a different culture and a different time. And so I believe in the, like David, I believe in the value. I don't believe in the value of tradition, but I believe in the value of early Christian tradition, not the later stuff. And it's not as good as scripture. It's not a replacement for scripture, but it is an, um, an, an echo of scripture that can remind us of scripture. And so I do believe in following that, not some guy in the Middle Ages who says, let's go kill all the men and women in some town in Italy because I don't like that family. Uh, not that kind of tradition, the tradition of the early Christians. Very good. Very good. Hey, I got another question. Oh, you want oh, wait, to say David's going to say something. Yeah, go ahead. Conformity and unity. This book and uh, all my publishing endeavors, 400 articles and what, 14 books, uh, I concentrate on ethics and don't get into the theory of whether the earth is flat or the atomic uh, theory is valid. And there is, uh, through the 1,600 pages of entries, uh, they are remarkably uniform on matters of ethics. Now, matters yes. of science and matters of personality, that's, that may be different. I concentrate only on ethics. And the only um, uh, contradiction I found is whether a Christian should run away from a town uh, in a time of persecution. Some, mm -hmm. including, should run away, others say not. Other than that, I found no problems in 1,600 pages of contradiction in Christian ethics in the tradition. Okay. So, 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 so like me, you found great uniformity on things relating to the Bible. On yes. things relating to, to ethics. In ethics, yes. Okay. Biblical like oh. ethics. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now I got a question for you. Uh, does apostolic succession matter? For instance, the bishop, of course, must be from an unbroken line of bishops stemming from the original apostles selected by Jesus Christ. Thus, apostolic succession is necessary for the valid celebration of the sacraments. Now, that's basically putting a, condi a condition on salvation. So apparently, apostolic succession matters to the extent that it can affect your salvation. So, David, go ahead and why don't you tackle this one? That's that's Amen. not my that's not my opinion. That's not uh, my conclusion. It's a statement of what uh, believers in the apostolic tradition think, not myself. And uh, since there is no apostolic succession anymore, uh, we have to get our salvation um, by, through general Christianity. Amen. And in fact, the, the reason I'm bringing this up, and Steve, you answer next, uh, I'm bringing this up because, see, all of a sudden, this apostolic succession sounds like a different gospel, because all of a sudden, you've got to have this in order to have a valid celebration of the sacraments, which also relate to your salvation. So to me, I'm sort of looking at this as like a Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 through 9 situation. Because this this can lead to a false gospel. So, they, uh, Steve, pick it up there. Steve, what do you have to say? All right. Well, let's go back to Jesus. And when Jesus at the Lord's Supper, he said, "Whatever you do, you know, whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me." At that time, he didn't discuss apostolic succession, and apparently, you know, apostolic succession, even if it were true wouldn't be near as important as what is discussed in the Bible because it wasn't important enough to, to mention anyway. Now, as to whether it's important or not, uh, kind of depends. Like, for example, is the Inquisition important? Well, if you're, you may not believe it's important, but if you're about to be burned at the stake, you know, for some reason, yes, it, it becomes very important to you, but, but, <laughs> but, but it's not true. So apostolic succession, I would argue in a perverse way, that it is important in keeping people in bondage and in keeping people yes. under the control of somebody. But as far yes. as the biblical truth, it is irrelevant. That's right. Very good. Very well stated. Okay. Here's another question for you coming from the other side. Uh, why is apostolic succession essential to be considered 
a church. Not only does it help pass on this hierarchy or holy order Jesus and the apostles established, it also provides the vehicle by which the truths of the faith Jesus, Jesus left of the faith Jesus left to the church are passed on in a living way and protected from error by the Holy Spirit. So without apostolic succession, you can't have a real Christian church under the auspices of Jesus and the apostles. And in, in, in this apostolic succession at the same time protects you from any error, from, you know, because the Holy Spirit will make sure you know error happens to a church that has apostolic succession. Okay, David, what do you have to say to this argument by people that believe in it? Yes, it is another gospel. If uh, if if salvation is available only through the sacraments, and the sacraments are only valid in the apostolic tradition, apostolic succession. Um, there, it, but the uh, same teaching can be transmitted and is transmitted, and it's better transmitted by members of the laity, um, uh, carrying, uh, uh, living a practical Christian life, and the and uh, living as Christ and the apostles taught, and uh, passing that along to the younger generation, such as through Sunday schools, rather than the bishop. Excellent. All right, Steve, what do you, what do you have to say about this? Well, I, I guess I, I would defer um, answering. I'll defer to Paul. <laughs> All right, in Second <laughs> Corinthians 11, uh, uh, starting in verse 2, Paul says, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste version of Christ. But I fear, lest somehow, as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Okay? For if one co comes who preaches a, another Jesus whom we've not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you've not received, or a different gospel which you've not accepted, you will put up with it. And he's rebuking for, uh, the, them for that. And so the whole point is look to Jesus. We can argue a lot over, you know, is the apostolic succession with the Roman Catholic Church, the Copts, the Eastern Orthodox, who's it with, um, do we have it at all? And the whole thing is uh, sort of a distraction. Apostolic succession is maybe not only bad, but it's a distraction from looking to Christ. And also, I think it's a it's a covering for for the hierarchy, not a covering in the way that you said, Larry, you know, or or, or the other uh, about a, a truth. But it's a covering so that people who want to control others and get money and do evil things. Um, have justifications for saying, well, you got to keep me in power because, you know, I, I have apostolic succession versus somebody mm -hmm. say, hey, if you're not following God, then, uh, you know, we're not going to follow you. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it 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 it's served a negative purpose as a cover. Yep. In I fact, uh, both of you have already proven the point in, in this broadcast that uh, apostolic succession, succession does not protect members of a church that use it uh, from error <laughs> mm. uh, the churches that claim to have it they're full of errors and so th there's obviously a, a historical record that proves that they've got no protection of errors by the holy spirit uh you know because it's just not a true doctrine in the first place as all three of us have established okay here's a uh, one more question for you does apostolic succession supersede the scriptures themselves? Okay, so the question, most of the people that are in these kind of churches say, well, it's the church that gave us the Bible. You get that a lot from Roman Catholic apologists and even some Greek Orthodox and some of these other guys, because you've got to have this apostolic succession church. They're actually more important than the word of God is. So, that's one of their arguments. Uh, in fact, I, I was answering a lot of YouTube comments last night. Uh, we get hundreds of YouTube comments across our 800 videos on our, our channel and on all kinds of topics and subjects. And then one, one Roman Catholic guy was uh, going, answering one of our uh, videos on Roman Catholicism. But anyway, he was just saying, it was just a short, terse turn comment. He just said, 
Look, the Roman Catholic Church is the church. We made the Bible, but the church is what's important. I mean, he actually just said that. It's about, I'm, I'm paraphrasing it, but it was about like that. It was pretty short, but that was his argument. So it's the church that matters, not the word, not the Bible, not the word of God. So, uh, okay, David, how do you respond to an argument like that on why uh, apostolic succession proves that a church is true and that they gave us the Bible? Most of the church councils that uh, gave early pronouncements on uh, on what books were in the Bible were in the East, which ranked them in the Orthodox camp rather than the Roman Catholic camp. Mm -hmm. And I go into this uh, deeply in, in another book that uh, um, just as I have no more control over a copy of uh, this book, once it's sold, somebody can tear it up or write in it or so on, that doesn't make me Lord of the book forever. So uh, even though uh, some churchmen, and this is uh, disputed, and it, it's put too simply to say the church decided what uh, books are in the Bible. Um, the um, problem is that uh, they their powers ended right there. They can't uh, uh, ca carry on as if the Bible didn't exist to guide us. Uh, and there was another part of that question. I was just, well, that was pretty much it. It was, does apostolic succession supersede the scripture? Is, uh, Irene, is, Irenaeus is addressed, Irenaeus addressed the point saying that if we did not have the scriptures, then we could go to the apostolic succession to ascertain the apostolic tradition so that uh, Irenaeus acknowledged the scripture is above bishops anyway. The uh, the scriptures are above uh, bishops in the apostolic succession, such as existed. Right, Steve is, okay. I, 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 wait, wait, well, I, I would ask that Catholic guy, so you're saying God had nothing to do with your religion? Who? <laughs> the, the, well, the, 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 the Catholic guy, guy that, that, that said the church gave the Bible. On YouTube. The YouTube yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I would say, so, so the church, so God had nothing to do with it, is, uh, according to you. And, and 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 so what what I would say is no that the Catholic Church or or even Orthodox Church didn't give us scripture God gave us his word God gave us scripture however I do concede that we owe a debt to the early Christians for recognizing scripture and mm -hmm. as they and as they had the discussions and they and 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 they knew things and and the Gnostics tried to fake their own scripture. And by the way, there's no one group called Gnostics. There are actually 30 different groups that all, you know, different among themselves. I think David alluded to that earlier. But that, um, so really, is your church based upon apostolic succession, papal succession, tradition, something else? Or is your church body based upon God? And I would say, before getting misunderstood, that salvation is not an organization. The true church is not the, you know, church I go to. It's not the church building. The true church is all genuine believers uh, who happen to attend different churches. And they also believe differently on secondary matters. But the, but, but the true church, the, the, the only head of the true church is Jesus Christ. There is no one human who, who, who is head of the true church on earth. And we have to realize it's not about the organization. It's and it's not about apostolic succession. It's about Jesus. So I, I guess an apostolic succession, uh, one, it didn't confer anything as far as doctrinal purity, as far as uh, 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 you know, good leaders or leadership following God. But then, as David brought up. We never necessarily had really had apostolic succession in the first place after the mid second uh, 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 century at the at the at the very latest even, and so the claim of apostolic succession has been at best a distraction uh, from our from our following the truth and following God, and at worst it's been a tool that people have used to try to wield power you know, uh, uh, ecclesiastical and, and, and political and even physical power over, over others. And so I guess, you know, keep it simple. Uh, is, is God's word is true, but you really think that what God told us is sufficient. Has God told us everything we need? And if he has, 
then we don't have to put a lot of stock in things that scripture is totally silent about. Excellent. Excellent. So Dave, uh, what is, what are your concluding remarks on this whole topic of uh, apostolic succession? The first uh, paragraph of uh, my introduction today and the last paragraph of uh, chapter nine of the book. Recently, some major Lutheran denominations have been receiving at least the title of apostolic succession, getting it from the Anglicans. Uh, but it's not yet known how much the, the, their bishops will use it to create new powers for themselves over their flocks. So uh, Christians, especially Lutherans, uh, should be very wary of uh, any assertion, whatever, from any quarter to apostolic succession, because it means uh, the, it's the uh, the foothold, the uh, the wedge in getting of uh, one man at the top of a diocese getting more control of the church for himself. And um, as for the last paragraph of the book that uh, sums up everything, apostolic succession seemed like a good idea when first proposed but so did Prohibition, Community of Goods, the Russian Revolution of 1917, and many marriages. Subsequent practitioners who have learned better and formed different evaluations. And this is one of the evaluations. Excellent. Well said. Great book. I'd recommend your book, David, to everyone. Do like I did. You can just buy it on Amazon. You know, it's good reading. Good. You've got a lot of good historical church fathers in here. Really works out well to support your case. And uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, for this broadcast. Scripture is God's word to mankind. It is inspired or breathed by God, meaning every word in every part of the original manuscripts comes from God. Quote, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Second Timothy chapter three, verse 16 through 17. The Bible is also inerrant, meaning every word in every part of its original handwritten stage is without error. That's second Peter chapter one, verses 20 through 21, Psalm 12, six, Proverbs 30, verse five, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, the importance of the Bible is that it gives us the opportunity to see and know God. The scriptures reveal his character and nature, his sovereignty and power, and his reason for creating us, the universe, and everything in it. We read about God's dealings with humankind, his goodness and grace, his light and love, his holiness and justice, and his mercy and compassion. The Bible reveals God's desire from the beginning to have a people of his own, Leviticus chapter 26, verse 12. In it, we learn about the perfect fellowship that humans once had with God in paradise and how it was broken by sin and disobedience. But through the sacrifice of God's son, Jesus Christ, we can be forgiven. We discovered that God desires to redeem us and restore us to a right relationship with himself. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, verses 18 through 19. Through reading God's word, we can come to understand the purpose of our lives as well as God's plans from the beginning of time through all eternity. 1 Peter 2 9, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. The importance of the Bible is that it is a life giving book. The word of God is alive and powerful, quote, sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword cutting through soul and spirit between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires, end quote. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The God who desires to redeem us gave his word the power to save us, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. We, quote, have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. Through the living and enduring word of God, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Not only does the Bible have the power to save us, but also has the power to sanctify us. Quote, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. God's word 
has the power to cleanse us, sanctify us, and make us holy. John chapter 15, verse 3, John 17, 17, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. And his word gives us the power to defeat sin and bring our thoughts into spiritual obedience to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 through 5. The importance of the Bible is that it shows us God's will. By obeying what the Lord says in the Bible, we can keep ourselves pure. Psalm 119, verse 9 and verse 11. Meditating on the teachings of Scripture will cause us to prosper spiritually and bring blessings and true success in life. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, James 1, 25. The Bible contains essential wisdom and guidance for making our way through life. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 119, verse 105. Jesus taught us to depend on God's word for our daily bread. We cannot underestimate the importance of consuming it regularly, for it is the fuel of our spiritual lives. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. God's word equips and empowers us to serve him. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 17, Hebrews 4, 12, and we can wield it as our greatest offensive weapon against our adversary, the devil, and the powers of darkness. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. The word of God is eternal. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8. Truth is eternal. Quote, the sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. End quote. Psalm 119, verse 160. How can we doubt the importance of the Bible when we read, quote, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Matthew chapter 24, verse 35. See our video called Both Fake Christians and Pagans Deny the Bible and Jesus Alike, since Jesus said, Holy Scripture is true. See also our video called Bible Says Most Will Go to Eternal Damnation, But a Few Will Receive God's Grace and Go to Eternal Joy. See also our video called what is the gospel according to the Bible? Short version gospel to more detailed explanations. See our YouTube channel at C Answers TV with over 840 videos, including a playlist with 86 videos called Dealing with Anti Trinitarians, UPC, and Early Church History. Well, I want to thank everyone for being with us to watch this show today. And if you hung there, you hung with us all the way to the end. Uh, special kudos go to you for hanging in there. Uh, I want to let you know as I get ready to sign off that uh, we have newsletters available. You can uh, email us at cdebater at aol.com to get, a, get a, a copy of this. This newsletter, this one happens to be on how sovereign is God, but we have lots of newsletters so feel free to email for that. Uh, and uh, with that said, uh, I want you to be, be ready to join us again for another broadcast of Christian Answers Presents. It could be on any any topic at all. We never know really what we're going to put up next or how the Lord leads us and whatever we do. But uh, we'll uh, try to be faithful and keep putting those shows out there for you and and leave it to God to bless those whom he will. Well, with that said, I uh, want to remind you about John chapter 14, verse 6, which says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the only way to eternal salvation. Uh, and without Jesus as your cornerstone, your, your God, your Savior, you're, you're all, the second person of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You're lost. We don't want that. We want you to come to him so that you can spend e eternal life in glory with the triune 
God for all forever. So with that said, uh, be with us again next time. I'm Larry Wessels for Christian Answers Presents. God bless you all. If you like our YouTube channel, please subscribe by clicking on the subscribe button and then by also clicking the bell above to get an automatic update whenever we produce another YouTube video for our See Answers TV channel. Please share our videos with your friends and relatives. May God bless you. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what is done for Christ will last. See related videos by tapping or clicking screens.